Hey everybody, welcome to FNS 236. Um, there are a couple chapters that we need to cover before the end of the semester, one of which is OSHA, the other one is FTC. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity since we're not meeting this week because of the holiday to get uh, at least one of those done via video lecture for you. So um, hopefully I can be as eloquent as uh, Ms. Professor Jones is when she does these for you. Um, bear with me, I haven't done one before, so if it's a little choppy or can't read my handwriting. It'll be just like regular class. Anyway, <clears throat> let's talk first about OSHA. What does OSHA stand for? The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is a watchdog group that oversees employers making sure that they provide safe working environments for employees. For example, this is a classroom at TCC. Um, <clears throat> Well, this probably, classroom is probably a bad example. We have a prep room down the hall, and there are certain things that we have to do in that preparation room to make sure it's safe for not only you, the student, but as well as, as the employee who is teaching the lab. So we have to provide things like gowns and gloves and those sorts of things that are required, just like a normal funeral home would have to do for their employees. I couldn't very well send you into a preparation room to embalm and not give you gloves that fit, not give you a mask, not give you shoe covers and a gown to make sure that you don't get blood and body fluids on you. So that's what OSHA does. They look out for the employees. Now, with funeral homes, you know, obviously there are hazards, but in other industry, there are a lot of hazards like mining and things of that nature where employees can go to work and they can be killed in an instant um, if an employer doesn't provide safety equipment and, and safeguards to make sure that the workers are, are, are working in an environment where the hazards are, are at a minimum. Um, <clears throat> the only time an agency, a firm, is not subject to OSHA rule is when the owner is a sole proprietor, meaning he owns and operates a business and he's the only employee. If he has an employee, then that employee certainly would need to have a safe working environment, and so OSHA would, would be concerned with that. But the, the belief is that if you're working for yourself, and you're not gonna have yourself working in an unhealthy environment. And if you are, then the other person harmed by that is you. And so OSHA is not so concerned about the sole proprietor who's the owner operator and the only employee. Now, um, you always wanna make sure that you're, you're OSHA compl compliant because there are a lot of hazards, especially in a funeral home, where if you're exposed to something at a higher level than is acceptable, it may not manifest itself for several years down the line. So you could find out 10 or 15 years later that you've been harmed by the fact that you were working for a particular firm for a period of time. And so OSHA compliance is very, very important. Now, there are three rules, three OSHA standards, three OSHA rules that impact the funeral home. Uh, let's see, the first one is what we call the formaldehyde rule. And what I'll do typically is I'll abbreviate that. Uh, when you get into embalming and we cover that, the topics um, that deal with formaldehyde, we we'll always abbreviate it. We call it HCHO, which will stand for formaldehyde. Number two, because the dead human remains sometimes harbor bacteria and pathogens that you don't necessarily want to come in contact with without a barrier between them and you, um, OSHA has a rule that we call the biohazard rule. And then the last one is what we call the hazardous communication. Hazardous communication simply means that if there's something that can cause harm to a person, we need to communicate that hazard to you. For example, if you are working in an area where there are flammable liquids behind a particular door, OSHA is gonna require that there be a sign on the door that says, no smoking, uh, flammable liquids or flammable materials or combustible materials inside. It's just common sense that if you've got something that could hurt someone, that you communicate that hazard to them. So, that being said, let's look first to the formaldehyde rule because it's probably the longest and most complex of the OSHA rules. First thing we wanna talk about as it pertains to the formaldehyde rule are what we call permissible levels of exposure to formaldehyde. 
Formaldehyde has been known to be what we call a carcinogen, meaning that if you're exposed to it for a long period of time at elevated levels, it could potentially cause cancer for you, different types of cancer. And so OSHA has these levels that have been studied over the years and developed whereby if you're exposed to less than this for this amount of time, then the likelihood of you becoming ill by virtue of your exposure is very low. And so first one we have is what's called a permissible exposure limit or PEL. The PEL for formaldehyde is that you should be exposed to no more than 0.75 parts per million of formaldehyde to oxygen for an eight hour period. What does that mean? That means that if you're working in an environment, an embalming environment, if you will, and you're in a preparation room as an embalmer, then we should test the levels periodically to make sure that the level of formaldehyde in the room doesn't go over to, doesn't exceed 75 parts per million of formaldehyde to a million parts of air during that eight hour period. So, now, this is where it gets a little bit complex, this eight hours. Nobody embalms for eight hours straight. It just doesn't happen. Either one or two things are going to happen. You're going to run out of work, um, meaning that you're going to complete all of the tasks for a particular day. Um, you're going to stop to take breaks to go lunch, to use the bathroom, to get a cup of coffee. You're going to have other tasks that you do during the day. So one standing in a preparation room over an embalming table for eight hours while someone, I guess, hypothetically slides more bodies on and takes one off and puts another one on, and you just continuously embalm. It just doesn't happen. And so in order to evaluate and determine what the exposure is over an eight hour period, since no one's gonna be in a room for eight hours, OSHA uses what's called a time-weighted average. And a time-weighted average is simply a way of equating the amount of time that you spent in the preparation room embalming to what your exposure would have been over an eight hour period. So for example, if a, a worker comes in and they start to embalm at 8 a.m. and they finish at 10 a.m. and that's the cleanup and everything. Obviously that's not eight hours, but there's a formula with this time-weighted average that would equate these two hours to what your exposure would have been over eight hours. Um, I always use the example, if you get in your car and you're driving 60 miles an hour on I-64 leaving here. Well, in about two hours you're gonna be somewhere north or, or somewhere near Richmond. But if you drive for eight hours, you likely will be somewhere near, I don't know, St. Louis, I guess uh, I-64 will run down that way. So the time-weighted average is a way of getting a snapshot of the amount of time that you spent embalming and equating it to what it would have been if you had continued embalming for that period of time. Next limit OSHA looks at is the short-term exposure limit. Because for a shorter period of time, you can be exposed to more formaldehyde, OSHA also wants to know what the short-term exposure limit is. And they've set that limit at two parts per million over a 15-minute period. Now is probably a good time to explain how testing is done. When you do these tests, what happens is you, call, you order a test kit from your chemical company, and you'll order two of them. And most, most of the time when I do it, I order three just in case I make an error. Um, and what we do is we get dressed to a bomb and we take this badge and we uncover it because it's gonna be in plastic and it's gonna have a little thing on it that is the formaldehyde sensor that's covered and you clip it on. That's when you start a bomb, okay? So we're gonna document the time that we start. Again, we had that eight o'clock uh, example a moment ago. And we're gonna document when we stop. We take that thing and we seal it back into a cellophane package or into a Ziploc bag that's generally enclosed and we send it off to the company. Company's gonna look at the, the amount, they're gonna measure the amount of formaldehyde that was absorbed by this thing over the time period, apply that time-weighted average, and then they're gonna send you a nice printout that tells you what your exposure limit would have been for an eight-hour period. Likewise, you're gonna do a short-term test as well. Most of the time, people do them at the same time. Um, we'll document when we stop. We carry this one on for as long as the operation takes, and the short-term one, we test for 15 minutes, we set an alarm clock or what have you to go off and we know that it's time to take the short-term exposure limit badge off and put it in the Ziploc bag and send it. Now, 
So we've got a permissible exposure limit, which is our long term. We've got a short term exposure limit, which is our shorter term. And we also know what the time weighted average is. Now, a couple of scenarios are going to happen. When you get your test back, either you're going to be above 0.75, you're going to be at 0.75, or you're going to be below 0.75. Okay. What does that mean? Well, if you're below 0.75, then generally no action is required. If you're above 0.75, then we need to show some efforts to reduce this formaldehyde exposure in the room because if someone is above 0.75 or at 0.75, then that means that there's more vapor, there's more formaldehyde in the room than is permissible for one to work in this environment for a number of years and, and not get sick. Okay. Now, because this 0.75 is so very important, OSHA has all, also established what we call an action level. What is an action level? Well, an action level works a lot of times like your grades. Um, during a regular semester, when I give a midterm exam, I'll send you a nice email that'll say, hey, grades are available. Um, this is where you are. And that's kind of a, a thing to let you know, hey, if you're a way above 77%, which is a passing grade, then you're fine. If you're at 77%, then you probably need to take some action to make sure that you at least maintain that or boost your grade. And if you're below 77%, then you definitely need to take action. Same thing here. The action level for formaldehyde is set at 0.5 parts per million for an eight-hour period. Okay. Now, notice that the action level is below the permissible exposure limit which will tell a person who's testing, a manager, a, a owner, that, hey, I recognize that I need to be below 0.75. But in being below 0.75, if I am at 0.50, then I probably need to take action to make sure that I don't get above that. Um, I rented a car one time that had this uh, speed limit sensor on it. And every time you got above 55 or 60 or whatever it was set at, it would start to, to vibrate. Well, it, it's annoying, but the fact of the matter is if you've got something to let you know before you speed that you're about to speed, then the likelihood of you speeding is, 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 is a lot less. Same principle here. If you've got an action level that tells you, hey, you're not at the, expo the permissible exposure limit yet, li yet, but you're approaching it, so let's do something to reduce it now. Um, as opposed to waiting until you get above, because if you get above, then it could be to the detriment of the employees that work for you. So we've got our permissible exposure limit, we know what a short-term exposure limit, and we know that our action level is at 0.5 parts per million. Now, again, let's go back to these scenarios as to what could happen as a result of testing. Now, we definitely don't want to be above 0.75. We also don't want to be above 0.5, okay, because this is that action level. Okay. So what happens is either we're here, which means we definitely need to do something, or we're here, which also means we definitely need to do something, or we're here, which means that, hey, we, we haven't gotten there yet, but OSHA's going to require that we do something, or we're here, or we're below here. This is the golden place we want to be, which is below the action level, obviously below the permissible exposure limit, in any of these areas here, we need to take some action to make sure that we get our levels down. What are those actions that we can take? Well, number one, we could take, evaluate the types of chemicals that we're using. Okay, we could be using chemicals that are, are too strong. There are a lot of products on the market now that are advertised as lower exposure, meaning that they have less formaldehyde. Um, they're still as effective but there are times when we embalm that we don't need that much formaldehyde. And so in those cases, we can use our lower exposure fluids. Okay. We can do things like add a positive airflow to the room. And one of the ways we can do that is simply by opening a door while you embalm. Okay. Um, we can clean our exhaust fan. Um, OSHA requires there be an exhaust fan inside of your preparation room that will move the old air out and bring in new air. Well, adding a positive air floor allows for more fresh air to come in, which turns over the, the air in the room more frequently, thus making it more 
safely for an employee to work here. 